Hello and welcome to Sharp HR Career Corner with Karen Sharp Price. This podcast will inform and inspire you in your quest to find the right career path. If you're just starting out, looking to make a change in your field or transitioning into a new career, then this podcast is for you. We will be sharing tips and providing resources on topics such as writing resumes, interviewing, using LinkedIn, and networking. We will take a look at different careers, companies, and opportunities. You will hear success stories from professionals in all career paths, and so much more. You will leave this podcast with three key takeaways that you can easily put into practice. Enjoy! Welcome to Sharp HR Career Corner. I have a disclaimer this episode. I have known my guests pretty much my entire life, 50 plus years. We grew up two houses down from each other, and Sue and my sister have been friends ever since. Now, I won't bring up the days of the solid gold dancer in their kitchen. We'll, we'll keep that quiet, but I would like to introduce you to Reverend Susan Frawley. Thank you so much for being on today. Thank you so much for having me, Karen. It's a pleasure to be here. And, and if you want to break out in sol- solid gold dancing, you can. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I would need your uh, grandma's lemon meringue pie to help inspire me. <laughs> Little inside jokes, but the fun of the fun of having childhood touchstones where you can remember those things. It's beautiful. It is. And it's amazing with the group from our street, how many people we still are connected to and how many people remember moments in our lives that I I don't really remember, like, you know, sleepovers and my grandmother telling stories. Like I don't really remember that, but some of my friends will point out some of the things that she said. <laughs> I'll be like, that sounds like her. So I, I would say it's probably her. <laughs> So, um, okay, so I picked this month to have you on because June is LGBTQ plus Pride Month, and I wanted to have a conversation around the LGBTQ community. So I would like to start with where you're at. So you're the coordinator of the Guilds of Western New York. Is that how you say it? Or Gliss. I like Gliss. Gil. All right. <laughs> it's a very breathable aspect. Yes, but usually Gliss. Yes. Gliss. Okay. And you're a minister at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Hamburg. So right. can you tell me the work that you do there? Sure. So um, I'll start with Gliss. So Gliss used to be Gay and Lesbian Youth Services, and they've changed their name to be more expansive of the variety of youth and families to growing LGBTQ plus youth support. And in that way, it encompasses so much um, of the various things we do. My particular job is reaching out and connecting with parents. I do that a lot through schools, family support networks, um, other types of mechanisms that parents may be connected to, as well as community groups. So again, I'm reaching out to mental health, medical, business. And in that, uh, we provide training, we provide dialogue, we provide advocacy and support. I run a support group for parents of transgender and gender creative youth. And I also advise with a group of parents for our gender creative youth. And these are our youth who are from ages four to eight. And uh, those parents, yeah. And I can talk about that a little bit later because I know that's a contentious issue sometimes of how can kids that age understand? But I promise I will answer that and give you scientific fact. Um, Okay. As well as uh, providing other services throughout the community that help to educate and also advocate for our youth and for our families uh, when there is a need. So that's what I do at Gliss. And then when I'm not doing that, I am the minister at the UU Hamburg Church. And in that, uh, very similar in a way, because I reach out to community, do a lot of community building. My motto is ministry on the block. And I'm lucky that my congregation, they take that focus. And so we try to do things in the Hamburg community that advance for social justice and community aid. Wow. Well, between the two of those, that's got to keep you extremely busy. It does. But then I also have a teen and a tween, and that's my <laughs> real job in this life. And that keeps me the busiest. So. We learn a lot from, from our kids. I'll, I'll tell you that. I've, I've become better educated in a lot of different things uh, because that's the only way you can kind of keep your pulse on what's going on out in the community is just listening yep. to our kids. Yeah. So, so tell us about your own personal story. Like, how did you get to this part? How old were, I mean, cause you just talked about a group of kids that you're working with that are four to eight, that is really young. So if, you know, what would you like to share about your own personal journey? Sure. And, and thank you for this opportunity. So I'm 63 years old, almost 63 years old. And, um, when I look back historically, especially my youth, 
There were very rigid and specific roles for gender and for sexuality. No one talked about anyone being gay or lesbian. In fact, the phrase was homosexual. And it was always with this sort of a, a wink and a smirk and a rather you know unpleasant taste in the mouth of, of dealing with those words. So I think my whole life, I always knew that I was gay, but I never had a vehicle, an avenue, an aspect to be able to share that, to explore that, um, or to have safety. Mm. Uh, I can remember in high school playing sports uh, and that felt like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at least feeling a little more authentic because I always wanted to play sports, but they said that that was only for boys. And I was mm -hmm. very lucky that uh, the federal law of Title IX came through in 1973, the year I was a freshman, and that made equity. Prior to that, I couldn't, when I was in elementary school, there were no sports for girls. The really? only choice was to be a cheerleader. And I definitely wow. wasn't going to be a cheerleader. Yeah. In fact, a real interesting part of that law, when I went to high school, I really was interested in technical theater, and I wanted to learn about um, audiovisual aspects, um, but it was an all-boys club. But because that Title IX had just passed, a wonderful teacher, Catherine Mazio, actually now she's Catherine Chesley, I'll give her a shout out, because this woman went and advocated that, hey, there is a federal law, and if this girl wants to join, she has a right to do that. Now, I never wow. knew that she did that or how far she went in advocating. I just knew that uh, when I was working on drama club and just helping with stage things, suddenly, like a month later, I was able to be in the club with AV and getting wow. trained, uh, which was very upsetting to the gentleman who was in charge and some of the guys. Uh, but again, my intentions for being there came through. But that's the kind of stuff that we don't always take into consideration, that there are so many advancements now that and the history isn't that far removed of where women and even men have gone forth and done something that seemed, you know, oh my God, uh, crazy and, and uh, you know, that first timing. But now so many people enjoy it. Soccer is a great one. If you go by Seneca Street in West Seneca, across from Pasquale's, soccer all over the place, girls yeah. playing soccer. When I was in high school, there was no soccer for girls. Really? And luckily there was a coach uh, who, got a bunch of us, a bunch of ragtag girls. We played on Saturdays. We traveled in our own areas. There were no teams locally. We had to go to Canada or Rochester. And that afforded me then the opportunity to be able to play soccer in college. But even then it was still limited. And again, there still weren't teams back here. Now, my niece played soccer all through high school. She's a goalie at a college, you know, it's just so different. Um, yeah. But it was because of those early beginnings. I had no, like, being LGBTQ, it's just, yeah, no, and I had no idea because, you know, so we're like, I think we're about nine years difference. Um, and, and growing up, because I was the third kid in my family, honestly, until you just said that, I didn't even know that that was a barrier because when I, when I came along nine years later, um, I played softball, I played um, sports, and I didn't even recognize that there was an issue for those before me. Yeah. The um, elementary school that you attended and I attended with your sister had a white line that was painted down the middle of the parking lot. Right? I remember that. And yeah. it was the boy side and the girl side. And there was real strict penalties that if you crossed over, problem was on the boys side is where the kickball field <laughs> and the basketball hoops, which after school you could go and play, but not during your recess time. That's true. And, yeah, and probably about the time that you had graduated after that, they eliminated the white line. How about that? Yeah. Or, you know, I think the white line then went back into the grass and so that you could have part of the field. <laughs> so, so how about that? I, I didn't even know that that was an issue. Yeah, huh. we, we lived with these things and nobody ever questioned it except my poor mother who would get called down and they'd say, Mrs. Frawley, your daughter went over the line again. And my mother would be like, why do you do this? I'm like, because I want to play basketball. <laughs> I just couldn't understand why I wouldn't be allowed. After school, if I went down there and played with the boys, no trouble. But yeah. recess, it never made sense to me. Wow. I remember when the ball would roll over, you know, like you, you, you would have to help because no one was allowed to cross the line. <laughs> Or no one did, you know, it's just this silly little white, yeah, I, like what's going to happen to you? But because we went to Catholic school, uh, I think we were told that God would strike you dead 
if yes. you cross the line during recess. Just yes. again, it's just those self-imposed things that come from standards in the society or community in which you live that you learn yeah. later. Well, that was stupid. Yeah, that yeah, that that fear of God was definitely there. Yeah. <laughs> it was. So so how did you get into uh, ministry then? Where where did that start to branch out? So ministry comes later. Um I went to school, I studied psychology and human services and went and got my master's degree, um, several master's degrees, and was a school counselor and a school administrator for many, many years. And at the same time, I also uh, was attending at a different uh, church. So I grew up Catholic, but in my later years, I started going to the Unitarian Church. And as I was getting near to the time that I was going to be retiring, I found myself doing more lay ministry. I would do summer sermons. I was helping with pastoral care. Uh, my minister at the time uh, convinced me to enroll in a program that Roswell does, which teaches you pastoral care visiting. Um, oh. And I thought she was just preparing me to be working with the church. But what I didn't realize is she saw something in me and realized that this was my time of making some determinations. Because when oh. I finished, I actually said, I think I want to go to seminary. And she goes, wow. I, think, I thought you did too. And that's why I thought if you took this course, that that might help you to uh, help to reflect on that. So right after that, I enrolled in seminary. And what's nice now, like so many colleges, we have the long distance learning. So you don't have to just mm. up and move. Um, you know, I have two kids, but I was able to do it from a distance and then just do intensive times as many schools do now. Yeah. And able to do my studies. And I was very intentional though. I really liked small churches. Everybody wants to go for the big churches. I knew I was retired. I knew I didn't have to make the big buck or get the health insurance. And I just kept saying, oh, these little churches, they never have ministers. So I intentionally studied the culture, the rules, the laws. I did my internships in small. And that's what I do now. I intentionally work in small communities. They're very different than a large oh. church, but they're so fulfilling. And they're very much, at least for me, so connected to the community component. So yeah. again, that just spoke to me. But I think that's been part of life as well is when you are segregated in a way. So as I started to become a little bit more aware that I was gay in high school and saw the divisions that continued a bit into college, and even in my initial employment, you know, as an adult, there were still so many laws and restrictions about being out and being your whole self and even laws that could prevent you from working or even getting housing or other things. So mm -hmm. I feel right now at this stage in my life, being my most authentic self, that inspires both my ministry and my work where I can encourage others to be their own selves, but then also reaching out and educating to a broader community as well. So, Well, and don't you think that because you've grown up through all of this and, and through the trials and tribulations of, of, of experiencing things um, personally, that now when you're in that ministry work, like you get it. And, and so you're talking to them from a very personal level and not just something that you read in a book. Oh, absolutely. I, Lived experience can, can not be understated, yeah. uh, especially when one is listening to others or uh, showing empathy. Um, but it also, I also find, so even with my kids, I find I ask the questions I wished people had asked of me, but uh -huh. asked in a way where it was inviting to answer as opposed to uh, asking to then put a penalty or a punishment. And I think that, because of the lived experience, really changes the way the communication goes as well. Sure. And we were talking, I said earlier that, you know, you learn so much from your kids. And, and I have, and I, I see from my boys who, you know, one's in college, one's in high school, but, but going through elementary, middle school, and especially high school now, their friends are so much more open to accepting. So in, in, in you spoke, you know, we grew up and we went to school in a, in a Catholic um, grammar school. You, you didn't talk about it. You didn't hear about it. You didn't, you know, you might've seen it, but you didn't like ruffle any feathers, but now it's so it's, it's flipped so much the other way. The kids are just so much more open about where they are, who they are, what they feel at this very moment. And, and again, it might, it might change a little bit along the way, but, but they're very, very free and they don't have 
the restrictions that you had growing up, and I don't think they'll ever appreciate what you went through growing up, um, but we're not talking that many years ago, the differences. When we look at history, um, today I just, you know, and we know that we're talking about Roe versus Wade, uh, just in general, yeah. and talking about the fact that it was 1924 when um, women had the right to vote, and 1973 when women were then allowed to have their own credit cards which prior to that, as a female, you were not allowed to have your own. I mean, isn't that amazing? Thing, right. And yet it's yeah. not that far away. Um, yeah. Even with, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the Title IX uh, that opened up because it had to do with fair and equal accesses. I remember that that was the first time teachers, female teachers were allowed to wear pants without penalty. Oh. In school. And that was only 45 years ago. Um, oh. So then we, we go on, you know, for things like uh, same-sex marriage, which really is only about, in terms of uh, national le uh, legality, about 12 years old. Um, and then just even going before that, uh, different statutes that allowed for, like New York State, we are so lucky. We have the New York, State's, uh, New York State Human Rights Act. And within that act, we have protections that do not exist on a federal level. And mm -hmm. this may surprise some of your listeners, Karen, but there is no federal law that protects with specific language LGBTQ people. There's no law. Wow. Yeah. So it's state by state. Pretty much. I mean, we have, you know, there's the uh, marriage equality, but that's about the union of marriage. But in terms of federal law, now, of course, people will look to Title VII or Title IX for areas of equal access. But in terms of, especially when we listen to some Supreme Court justices now speaking about specificity, of what is in the Constitution and then uh, law that follows. It's really important for people to know there is no law, federal law. So as each state wow. makes its own decisions, that really has impact. And we are seeing some crazy stuff going on in varieties of states that is having severe impact on people, both their mental health, their physical health, and just their ability to do their jobs and live in peace. Yeah, yeah. And, and unfortunately, I think we're going to be taking a really large step backwards and, um, and you, you know, I never thought that I'd see COVID or see this type of experience in my lifetime. I, I never thought because of technology and how far we've come in sciences and everything. Um, I never thought we'd have to look back and, and think about protecting ourselves and, and having the right to protect ourselves and make our own decisions. Like who, who would have thought that we would have to do that? When you, when you talk about our youth and, and how far they've come, the foremothers and the forefathers who fought for so many rights, fought for you know um, abortion rights, who fought for equal access, who fought for LGBTQ rights. And now you know, young people have so many, but it really is on the blood, tears, and bodies of those people. And we have to yeah. remember that. Um, yeah, it, it, it's true. Language. It's going to be, it's, 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 and we know, we sort of know that it's going to, and what that means and the interpretations that go with that and how that fans out is going to have effects for at least two generations to come after us. Yes, yes. And, and I don't know if the younger generations right now um, fully grasp what is, what could happen because that will impact their lives and their families' lives. Um, for, for years to come. And so they have these freedoms now um, when you compare them to what you were allowed to do at their same age. Um, it, it, you know, was almost handed to them so they don't know the, the trials or the tribulations. Um, and all of a sudden, those things might be taken away. And that's, it's, it's a scary time for us right now. And the advanced, um, looking at, you know, um the humanness of people. Uh, right now we're looking at women, but that also went to black individuals. It went to LGBTQ, um, handy, you know, impaired individuals. There's just so much that goes along. Uh, yeah. but I think that's why it's important, uh, again, in the work that I get to do, where I get to teach some of that history, to have those conversations, or even just any of us to point that out, like prom is coming up and there's a variety of young people who are going with groups or perhaps a, a you know, same sex part or, um, they don't always think it's same sex. It's, it's you know gender non-specific partners, and years ago that would never have been allowed. Or schools right. now that are changing it from 
uh, homecoming king and queen to just royals. Ah. Junior, and taking the gender components out of it so that it's accessible that most people wouldn't think about and wonder why but it's the same as last year i was filling out my daughter's middle school registration i don't know why i never saw this i don't think the elementary had it and it said father and mother well my ah. daughter has two women as her parents so I, I fill it out sort of sarcastically call up to the superintendent said you know this is ayla's father and he's like, what are you i said well i was just putting out the form i said you know, I'm wondering, could we switch that to parent slash guardian and maybe put three lines for foster families or guardianship? He's like, huh, nobody ever brought that up before. I said, I know, that's, I'm, we're just talking. <laughs> Within an hour, they changed it. Because oh my gosh. It's because nobody ever brought it up. And so that's an important wow. thing to remember. Sometimes people aren't intentionally creating. No. Information. It's just right. that nobody, the same with the court. Nobody ever thought of that. But when I yeah. spoke with one principal, he's like, you're right. That's what we're doing next year. So it's not about being right. It's just about making sure that all your students feel they have a place. And this is one small, tiny thing. Yeah, and, and I think it's that educational piece. I think that if people don't um, have a broader outlook on life and they don't get involved in things, then it never crosses their path and they don't know. They don't know what it means. And we we're talking about, you know, like educating. And I feel like I still need to be educated on a lot of this stuff. So when I was growing up, there was, I guess, the terms gay and, and lesbian. And then bisexual came later in, in my life, you know, maybe 90s, 2000. Exactly. Now, what I'm, what I'm confused about are the pronouns because there, there's a lot of them. And, and my kids actually have friends that want to be known as certain things. And so I'm, I'm trying to like put my, my head around it. But what I'm confused about one is the acronym for LGBTQ+. Now, what I saw recently, because I was looking up for, for Pride for June month, um, LGBTQIA, which then I heard was intersex, asexual, and agender. Does that then, is that the shorter, the plus means for those? Is that what that's for? That's exactly. Um, okay. There, there are so many um, nomenclatures that go within the LGB, you know, um, some, some of the young people will just say queer. Now for older people, queer was a word that was used before somebody was throwing a bottle at you. And I can say that from experience, yeah. but younger people, as is their pedagogy, they take words, they take styles. So they'll just use the word queer. Uh, to be that arcing umbrella. But oh, to be okay. fair, LGBTQ plus is inclusive of the many, many, many different words. There's no way you could put all of them. There's almost, we were counting up one time at GLIS, all the different designations or words. And I think we had about 34 of different ways that people use to identify wow. their own uh, sexual identity. But let me also say this to us here. There's a difference between your sexual identity and your gender identity. And so sometimes if you know someone's gender identity, you don't always know what their sexual affection identity is either. They can be very different. Wow. Yeah. So, so that, that gets a little confusing. So it is it, so is that where pronouns come in? Because what is yeah. like Z and they? Like why, how does one person become they? Right. So um, for many gender fluid, that means that a person does not necessarily fall on the binary, which is like male, female. Uh, okay. The same way we've had gay, lesbian, and always it was yep. like the men were gay, the women were lesbian. But there are so many people who are gender non-conforming, gender fluid. Um, and so, and then we also get into the aspects of transgender, which is a person yep. who is not holding the gender they were assigned at birth. Every one of us is assigned a gender at birth, but there's a whole process for that. It's not just about uh, bits and parts. There's over 43 different characteristics that a physician can use because some people are born with what is considered uh, gender ambiguity. And so uh, years okay. ago, they would just go snip or clip, here's your boy, here's your girl, and nobody ever talked about it. Now wow. ethnicians can be brought in to make some determinations or as is the medical model now, if a child is born in that fashion, they would be considered intersect, meaning that they hold different characteristics of within that binary but a specific gender is not given to them and they are just intersect. There's nothing to prevent that medically. 
and as oh. long as the child is informed and if there are other certain uh, issues, but it's actually healthier, which also goes to why New York State now for the latest law that came through is now allowing for birth certificates to just have an X and also driver's license now can and other forms in New York State. So it's not just male and female. There's an acknowledgement of the fact that there are other aspects of gender or so what does the x mean then on on those forms it just means that it's not male or female it's an x oh okay gender non-specific huh yeah okay that is a lot to think about it is because i know some people who are pregnant and when their child is born no matter what the they're going to put an x and their thinking is they want their child to make a determination of their gender for themselves Here's a little piece of information. There were no genders on birth certificates prior to the 1900s. It was only when insurance, government, and other actuarial types of things came in that we wanted to type and cast and keep numbers about people. Huh. So before that, you just, you know, here's your child. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah, that's that's interesting. So yeah. so what so what I and I don't even know what the right word is. It's not categorized, but what does Z mean? Okay. So pronouns. Um, as we know about pronouns, it's it's a modifier. It's it's used within sentencing. It gives another description of a character, and we've always lived with her, she, he, him. Again, interesting. In the 1800s, the pronouns were they, them, and thou. There was no gender to pronouns, and it's oh. almost kind of like the same time when we started doing other trackings that things started to become genderized. But if you go into some of your old Shakespearean or old English. That is absolutely how you will see the narratives and dialogues. Huh. You know, pray they, uh, uh, pray thee, brother, pray, pray them, thou hast passed, you know, just, you, we know these lines, we've heard these lines, and that's yeah. where it came from. Um, but then as things moved along into a more binary, genderized world, genderized world, then you saw the she and her, and it was taught as proper English, but it's really not accurate. So now for individuals who are gender fluid, gender binary, um, individuals who don't want to be following on the binary, or even individuals that just want to show affinity, they may use they and them, but there's other ones out there. There is here, Hearst, Zay, Zed. It sounds like I'm Canadian when I say that <laughs> one. And our young people even make up different pronouns. People say, well, wait a minute, it gets all crazy. I said, no, here's what it's about. If someone shares with you what their pronouns are, thank huh? them for being brave and ask them where they might want you to use those pronouns because they might be sharing with you, but they may not want everybody to know about it and then try your best. And if you're not sure, I always default to they and them because no matter what, I'm going to be right. And if you just (laughs) use that all the time, then you're fine unless somebody corrects you. And if you want to know somebody's pronouns, as actually someone did in a meeting today, they're like, well, Sue, your pronouns are, and I said, it's okay to ask me, but here's the best way you could say, Hi, my name is Sue, and my pronouns are she and her. Would you like to share your personal pronouns? And I say personal because it's not preferred. It's not something that can dismiss on a whim. It's really about every single one of us. And this I just can't emphasize this enough. Every one of us has pronouns. Some of right. us just don't think about it all the time. But for those for whom it really matters, it's important to affirm and acknowledge. Huh. And I think with generations, we, after the 1900s, we were just assigned the pronoun. Yes. We didn't really have much say in what their pronoun was going to be. <laughs> we yeah. led very tracked lives. And yeah. that goes along with both your sexual affections. There are many individuals who are living as adults now who grew up, they knew that they were gay or lesbian, but this is the way you live your life. So they marry, they did whatever. And then perhaps when they are widowed or other, suddenly now they are able to live their more authentic uh, self. Mm-hmm. And this happens a lot. Um, Mm -hmm. but what's greater is now our young people don't have to wait till they're older, that they're not under their parents' uh, roof, or they can work to be themselves. Uh, Although there are still places where it is not always safe for young people. And that's why, like on my house, I have little safe space sickers. So my children's friends know this is a safe space that you can come to if you want to talk about something or know about something. And it's not about sex. People think, well, you're talking about sex. I'm like, sometimes they just want to know about verbs they want to know about love and relationships for lgbtq individuals especially like in my age we never really learned about it we we had a heterosexual version 
but you didn't get to play that out. So sometimes I'll talk about you, you had like a later adolescent when you finally came out and you were freer to engage in relationships, but it wasn't always, um, it wasn't always healthy because there right. was always that element of secrecy. And that's why there was always troubles. And so people focused on that as opposed to the fact, gee, we have no healthy world where people right now can live. And that has been what the trailblazers through history have created for our young generation now. Well, it seems to have worked because I really feel that um, my kids' generation feel very comfortable. Um, and, and also in talking about their friends, it's, you know, it's just, this is who they are. Like, it's not, there's no, um, I don't know, there, there's no negativism. There's no putting them down. There's no bad thoughts. It's just a matter of factly. This is, this is where they're at. So, and I think that that is amazing from 50 years ago to not being able to tell anybody what you were yeah. to now it's okay. And you can be more than just the gay, lesbian, bi, now there's all these other things. So, I mean, in some ways, I think we've come a long way. Now, I wonder though, do you think that it's, because New York, I think we are a heart farther ahead in, um, in compared to other states. Do you think it's, because I don't know outside of our area, out of, of Buffalo, but do you think that we are more open than other places? I would say yes, because when we look at our educational curriculum in New York State, it is more open and affirming than possibly mm. a lot of other um, educational curriculums. And of course, we're being aware of that now because Texas absolutely forbids conversations. Um, Florida no too. Yes. And um, uh, was it Arkansas um, did another. It's just, I'm watching these. There's 43 different bills actively right now that are in various states, most of them in the mid to west, but some that are closer to home that absolutely would outlaw um, either uh, acknowledgement of transgender students, conversations about LGBTQ issues, um, not even being able to affirm a family. My kids go to school. My kids went to school right from the beginning. I was there and my kids call me da. I am not transgender. I just wasn't creative with my then wife about what we would be called. And everybody from the first day knew that that was, this is da, this is these children's parent. And I did that so that we wouldn't seem that far out, you know, volunteering mm -hmm. in the classroom, helping at the lunchroom, going on the field trips. It was very intentional. I wanted everybody to know that our family was just like everybody else and that my kids and, you know, they, they had access and were safe. And they were very lucky because they went to a school that that's their motto is about affirmation and welcoming. They walk the walk and at public school, a public school yep. that actually had like 50% uh, free lunches. So like they weren't going to the best, you know, like, you know, they normal, regular school, high end. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Yes, sometimes like, Oh, you must've been a private school or a Richie school. Sometimes those are the worst because sometimes you will find more discrimination. My kids uh -huh. were just in a regular public public school, but because of intentionality, because of conversations and dialogues, we helped to walk through there. I actually uh -huh. got to be the first butch lesbian president of the PTA. And I got to tell you, I'm really proud of that because it wasn't just about that. Being a marginalized person, it made me very aware where I reached out. We have a lot of uh, parents who come from other countries. So I would stalk the playground as my principal knew. We have a lot of uh, Chinese uh, parents. We had some from um, the Middle East. I'd find somebody who spoke English and get talking to them and then try to bring those parents in and connect with our school because that's how you pay it forward. It's not just about huh. sexuality. It's about helping other marginalized individuals to find that welcoming road. Wow. So, I mean, there's a lot of thought put out as to the things that you've done along the way to make the most impact and include everyone um, along the way as well. So let's shift a little bit like to work. Um, so how difficult is it to find work being a part of the LGBT Q plus community nowadays? Right now, it's not as hard, but when I was working, so let's go back way back. Um, if you were out, you weren't working. So like I was an educator. There were laws that would have prevented me as a public school educator from being a public school educator if I was an out lesbian. Laws that were on the books, those get moved. But then there'd be other little internal things. So even though the laws may have some protections, there were still things that could happen. One of my first days at a public school that I started at, I walked in and uh, 
you know, I was new. I was trying to learn learn the lay of the land. It was the teacher's lunchroom, and I sat down, um, said some hellos, and these guys were reading the paper and, and giggling and being funny, and they're like, "Oh, let's 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 you know ask the new girl." And I'm like, "What are you talking about?" And they go, "Do you know what Friday is?" I said, "Well, God, I hope it's payday." <laughs> <laughs> What's Friday? And they said, "Oh." Friday is October 11th. It's coming out day. It's when we find out who all the queers and the fairies are. And I died. Wow. I knew in that moment, if I ever came out or if they had any idea who I was, I was dead. So I had to play this role in my job just to keep peace and sanity. But yet at the same time, as I evolved, and then actually after I had tenure, I also realized that there were other families and other kids that needed mm. assistance and how to do that and walk that line. Now it's easier, but it wasn't back then. Yeah. And so there also had to be advocacy at the same time as there was also a potential threat. Oh. Um, and that was a fun, that was a, like a weird balancing beam to walk on. And I did, yeah. not everybody does, not everybody follows that. Um, not everybody pays those prices. And I most definitely did. But every bit of it was worth it to be where we are now. That now yeah. I, can, I can work in an agency where I get to wear my bow ties to work every day. I get to say words out loud. I go into schools. I speak with superintendents and school boards using words that I could have never possibly used for the majority of my career. Isn't and there amazing? are more and more jobs. Many businesses, as you know, as an HR person, mm -hmm. are employing people as their diversity uh, inclusion and equity officers, which yeah. really push for that. And yep. a lot of LGBTQ people find work there. Um, but even in other areas of research and uh, other areas um, of law, but just the everyday, that's the most mm -hmm. important yeah. part. You can be LGBTQ and do almost any job. You can be a police officer, a court judge, uh, work over at the uh, chemistry lab, work for the highway department. You can do anything because huh. right now there's nothing that would prevent you and your whole self uh, from being prohibited from that. So now, is that across the board? Is that across it, the whole entire yeah. United States? No. Oh, I would. <laughs> no. If I was okay. in Wisconsin, I'd probably be fired. Um, there's a lot of states that still have things on their boards. And that's why having federal laws and protections really help that. Right now, uh, I was speaking with some young people at a local high school. They're going to be graduating. Many of them are going to one of our local BOCES programs. They're going to be going into great trades, welding and um, oh. dental care. Uh, one was doing automotive. And I said, well, you know, how are you going to decide where you want to go? And they said, we are looking at every state and the things that are happening right now. And there is no way. They said, we'd like to stay in New York, but some places have better options for pay. But there's no way we're going to trade that if our rights and protections aren't there. So young oh. people are very aware of this and they're making choices about their life based on what they're seeing happen at different states. Wow. Isn't that, that's just, uh, it's unbelievable. It really, it really is. I mean, you really have to stop and think, really think that through because that is, that is really scary that in this day and age that you can't, you know, you have to be careful what, what state lines you're crossing. Right and what you're allowed to do. So in New York State, um, how do the laws affect L LGBTQ? So we're very workers? lucky in New York State that we have the New York State Human Rights Act, and it has several different other sections underneath it that speak specifically to protections in housing, employment, medical care for LGBTQ individuals. And we also have something called DASA. It's the um, uh, Dignity for All Students Act. Sorry, I was thinking discrimination and when I, was, when I want to say that act. And that is specific for school, which many states do not have. In fact, every one of our teachers in New York State has to take a three-hour training class to get their teaching certificate in this area. It's primarily designed to offset bullying, but it has specific language for LGBTQ students and that if there are offenses, ways that the district has to address that and all their things the district has to do to educate and make sure they're creating safe places. And that's New York State specific. Wow. So, I mean, <clears throat> a lot of people probably move into the area um, simply because they feel a little bit safer um, I mean, in many ways. Yeah. I mean, New York State, you know, people talk about our taxes and other things as well. But right now, there is nowhere else in the United States of America that I would rather live than here because there's nowhere else. 
understanding that with a change of governance, that could change too. And that's yeah. what's scary. Yeah, that, that is. So I realized that all of these topics really could be an episode um, because there's a lot that you're just giving us a little bit of each, but, but growing up, did you always believe that you were going to have kids and you become a parent? And if, if so, like what obstacles have you had to face along that journey? I didn't because I grew up in the times of the well of loneliness and the bell jar and every book. In fact, when I first came out, I mean, you know, you go into, if you went into the library, it was the HQ section. Every book had lesbian heroines dying or being killed. There was mm. nothing positive or affirming. I never saw families or anything like that. I just thought I would be the single person. I'd live my own little private life. Um, huh. I never imagined that I could be a parent. And as life evolved and changed and made that possible, I can't think of not being a parent. Um, mm. and, what, and, and it is the laws. I mean, it was first the law that allowed for legal marriage and then the continuance there that allowed for my children to have my health care, all the things that go into that. Um, okay. But uh, I never, I, I just never imagined it because it wasn't a reality in my world. Oh, huh. isn't that something? Yeah. So, you know, we were talking about crossing straight lines and not, not having the protection. Do you think that Buffalo is welcoming to the LGBT community as a whole, or does it depend on even the towns in which you live in? It can depend on the towns, I have to say. People have varying statements about that. I think there's some communities that are really working to advance their inclusivity. Um, I say it's Hamburg, uh, the town of Hamburg and the village of Hamburg, uh, where last year the very first small little pride celebration took place. And there was some pushback within the village. This year, the mayor is going to receive a pride flag and is going to speak at the village's pride celebration. There's huh. still places to go because that's a real heavy Trump conservative, uh, the Patriot families, there's contentions going on with the school board. But I can say that with, and it took conversations, not protests, dialogues connecting together. And there's some other little communities locally as well that are going through this, but it takes intentionality. Wow. But there's others that sadly know, I mean, you hear stories from people in the schools or people living that have had difficulties in renting or even getting mortgages. Uh, even though it may be a lovely area, it's not a place that's going to be supportive. So, uh, yeah, you know, I, we were, we were driving to a store last night and we were behind a, a big truck and um, a pickup truck and they had offensive stickers on the back. Um, and, and I just, in, I was with my husband and my son and, you know, we all saw them and we thought, you know, we, we actually spoke about them and then we, we actually happened to, we went all the way down transit and then we went to the same store. So we all had to wait until this guy got out of his car. Cause I had to see him. I had to see what kind of idiot he was that would have something that broad out there, you know? And, and I just thought where, you know, where do you come from? I, why can't we just be kinder to people? And, and it can be religion. It can be politics, it can be um, sexuality, it can be any of those things, but we need to just be a little bit more kinder to other people. And in some ways we came a long way. I felt like we really had made some major steps and then things like that just kind of bring it back home and you think, eh, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> no, it, you know, we saw a campaign that played on ignorance and fear. And I think, I, and I'm, you know, when the person got out of their car, I'm wondering if they looked like what you thought they would look like, or did they look different than what you imagined? No, they were, they were, you know, kind of a husky, um, cool glasses, couldn't see his eyes because they were really dark glasses, shades. Um, and, and I actually bumped into him in the store and he, we kind of came to the aisle at the same time. And he said, you know, I said, oh, go ahead. And he said, no, you, you know, you go ahead. And I thought, well, you got some manners, but you haven't quite got, you got it all yet. I, I, it's funny because, and I hear this back from people, I, I like to have conversations. And right near our church, there was a number of houses that were having Trump flags. People were like, you know, they were dismissing. I'm like, these are our neighbors. It's important that we talk with them. Because the reality is, no matter what, we all look like each other. And we really do. And we all have something that we're holding on to. And sometimes it's fear, sometimes it's an ignorance. And if we just talk together, and that's what I found, that's kind of that ministry on the block. 
Maybe they've never met a gay person. Maybe they've never right. met a black person. Maybe they've never had a conversation with a Muslim or a Jew and say, wow. And you think things are so different and so far apart. But once you can personalize with a name yeah. and a face, that's the steps next then to understanding. But that's what we're missing. People yeah. are just, you know, made into caricatures and we believe all these other assumptions without really knowing who people are. Yeah, and I think it's fear a lot of times. I, I think they're they're scared because they've possibly been told things growing up that that aren't really true. And so they haven't given the other person a chance to just, you know, just give their opinion. I, I think that, you know, everybody can have different opinions. That's fine. But but be respectful enough to just listen to the other opinion. We don't have to have arguments. We don't have to, you know, turn red face and, and bulging, you know, veins because we're so angry at somebody else not wanting to understand us. Just having those conversations, I think, is, is well, it's the first step, but, um, you know, we continuously have to make those first steps. It is. And I mean, sure. I, I've actually admitted sometimes, like, oh, I'm a minister, but you know what? I'm a racist. What do you mean you're a racist? Well, that's how I was raised. I was raised with certain ideas about different races and cultures of people. And I never knew any different until I met people. And then I had to unlearn those lessons. And again, it came from people who that's how they were taught. That's how generations of those things occur. And I'm not putting down my parents or others or yep. family. Like that's, we, you have to look at the root from which you come and what yep. you have learned. And when you learn something new or different, then you're able to do better. But yeah. if you've never been exposed, if you've never had experience. So when I say that, people are like I said, because that root is always there. It's an ongoing learning constantly to overcome those little tiny things, hopefully now that are in my system. But I know they were there. I, I said words and things I didn't know any better until yeah. somebody pointed it out to me. And then I worked to learn and be better. And I'm constantly still doing that because I, I even mess up on pronouns. I mess up on uh, identities. I, I, I don't sometimes understand some aspects of some cultures, but mm -hmm. I want to learn. And I yeah. hope that makes me better, but I'm not perfect. And if I yeah. understand that about others, then it helps us to have that greater dialogue together. And I think we all have that. I mean, in, you know, no one can be knowledgeable and, and understanding of everybody because we all have grown up in our own little bubble um, until, you know, you, you start to live life and get exposed to things. So I think we're all, you know, we all have that tendency. Some people are more open and willing to admit and apologize for wherever they've been or whatever they said or did. Um, but, you know, speaking on that, so what types of resources or, or even support groups are in the community right now for, let's say parents? I mean, I've known people whose children have um, decided to become transgender and at, you know, in just the last few years, there's not a lot of resources that they know about. They don't know where to go. So where would you group. say? Yeah. So GLIS has resources. We have support groups for parents of transgender youth or gender non-binary. Okay. Um, and we also, uh, PFLAG, uh, Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, and that is a local group. Um, we've actually combined with them because they didn't have as many parents. So it's like, no, bring them over. Even if their children are adults, which is not who Gliss normally serves, we oh, okay. will support the parents because the parent journey is very similar. There's also something called the Pride Center, and that also has support groups for parents as well as information. And there's another group, if you're in Niagara County, it's called Niagara Pride, and they have their own website as well. And there are different uh, education programs. Uh, there will be things forthcoming but it's a good touch point because they also okay. do a lot of community events that people can just come to and be with others, um, coffee shops. So there's there actually are uh, resources. People just don't always know that. And that's for the yeah. parents. But for the youth, oh my God, so many things. Many high schools now have a GSA. It's Gender Sexuality Alliance. It used to be called Gay Straight Alliance. And okay. it's part of a national program called GLSEN, Gay Lesbian Straight Educational Network which provides proven and known curriculums that are used in the school. It's school staff run. Locally, uh, GLIS is the chapter header. So we give support to the teachers as the teachers do the programming. And oh, it's okay. just a nice way for young people to connect in their schools with other youth, with a faculty member who they can see. It gives them another touchstone as well as getting supports from 
the other community programs. And GLIS has a ton of programs. We have drop-in centers. We have special theme activities. We have special programs for transgender and gender uh, uh, non-specific youth, as well as, again, we have family fests. We have, um, uh, we're going to be doing a gay, uh, a uh, GLIS prom is going to be coming up. And oh. any youth from 14 to 19 uh, can come. Uh, and just be part, just be their most authentic self. When you see these kids come in with some of their outfits and costuming and just being proud and real, you understand why it's important for them to have an activity, especially if they don't think they can go to their other school's prom in that fashion. So, yeah. So, where's your headquarters? Where, where is your, where so are you it, with COVID? It was very interesting because we were all kind of pushed out and back. So, we're very virtual. Um, okay. We have a website, G L Y S. WNY, GlissWesternNewYork.org. Okay. But we also do pop ups, meaning that we now are in all eight counties of Western New York. And oh, wow. those sites are listed on our website where young people can come maybe once a month. And there is facilitators from our program there. In the future, we will also hopefully be doing some parallel parenting support. Oh, um, wow. But again, just reaching out, meeting people where they are. That's what we found out with COVID, that having one set space sometimes yeah. limited who could come to you so yep. we're just going wow. where people are and hopefully giving services where people need them and i'll include that um in the description so that if people want to find you so i always ask my guests at the end of the podcast um, to give three pieces of advice so what would you share with someone who identifies within the lgbt community community um, when it comes to possibly work or parenthood or community what would you say i think the first thing for many people is for them to know they are not alone. Many individuals live in isolation. They don't live in big cities. They don't have these resources. They think they're the only person either in their town. And of course it looks that way. Mm -hmm. But once you know that you're not alone, that there are ways to connect with others through the Zoom, through virtual, uh, coming to the website, that's a first positive. Okay. The other part I would add to that too is that for everyone, respecting pronouns saves lives. And this is a proven statistic that came from the GLSEN School Climate Survey, as well as the Trevor Project. The Trevor Project is a national program that helps to reduce and look at uh, instances that go into uh, LGBTQ suicide because uh, youth that are LGBTQ have a 40% uh, possibility rate of committing suicide or having suicidal ideations. Actually, 82% wow. of the youth that they had talked about in this last COVID year said at some point they had a moment where they had an ideation that wow. was significant uh even if they're not acting out the potentials for self-harm and the youth reported back as well that when people respected their pronouns that was the beginning of creating that affirming and welcoming connection oh huh. yeah and the last was you know um it's not a piece of advice i, I said i would come back to it though uh people think that this is a phase that this is all because of media that kids will read a book and be talked into things. The Mayo Clinic, which is probably held in the esteem of Bible of, of, of medical and other, did an extensive research. It was published this year. It was printed up in the New York Times in February of this year as well. And what they said and found was that between the ages of 18 months and 24 months, most babies are aware to some degree of the gender identity that is coming upon them. By age three, they know what their gender identity is. By age five, they're living in the gender identity, either that is affirmed or that they feel is ascribed to them. And what's important yeah. about that is that definitely young people know their gender starts before they're born in terms of how people are already anticipating them. So if you think about babies right from the beginning, they're told and put into you know, you're a little boy, you're a little girl, you're this, you're that, and then oh. the roles that go with that. But for some young people, if you're three and you were assigned female at birth, but you know you're a male, if you are not by age five able to live your truth, the possibility of you having pathology issues as you go along go up exponentially. And if you are repressed, oppressed, or harmed or threatened, and that happens a lot, um, yeah. then we have a whole other societal issue which is why wow. it's so important and why now we do have young people who say with absolute truth, I'm this or I'm that, and they know who they are. The reality huh. is we all know 
I knew who, you know, there's gender identity and sexuality, but we know who we are. It's just a question of can we be honest and truthful in who we are? So that statistic really scares uh, me when you just said that because of the states that are about to impose restrictions on conversation at young ages. So what does that mean for those young people who will have to be something else for years before they're old enough that they can move out and live somewhere where they can be their true identity? If they make it. And yeah, that's, that's the problem. I, I anticipate a lot of youth suicides and death. I see a lot of death. Yeah, that's that's, that's really sad. sad. Yep. That's really sad. Well, I tell you, I, I could talk to you for a few more hours because like there's just so many different elements to this that um, are just they're so important right now in our lives. Like right now, there's so many things happening that these conversations have to take place and people have to be open to just listening and understanding and taking the time, just take the time to listen to somebody else's story. Um, so thank you so much for being on this podcast. I really learned a lot today and I, I probably have to play it over a few times to, to make sure that I understand everything, but, but no, I really, I, I really enjoyed our conversation. So thank you so much. Me too. Thank you so much. Thank you for making this platform and for all the people that will get to hear this. I really appreciate you doing that. Yeah, well, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for listening to Sharp HR Career Corner. If you've been sitting on the fence and you hate your job right now and you're thinking about making a move, but you're not sure where to begin, contact Sharp Human Resources. We can make you we can make sense of the process that you have to go through. So go to sharphumanresources-buffalo.com. Until next time, be kind, everyone. We need to show a lot more kindness in the world. And it starts with you and I. Thanks for listening and have a great day.